For all the warm hugs and all the stuff kisses. For always having time, no matter how tired you are. Thank you, Mommy, for never giving up on me, picking me up every time when I fall down. For always putting me first, no matter how long your list gets. Thank you, Mama, for all the dreams you have for me. And all the tears you shed. And always having room in your heart. No matter how crazy things may be. Thank you, Mom, for being my best friend and giving me all of you. Lord, teaching me what love means, no matter what the future holds. <laughs> Father God, what a beautiful day it is to come together to worship you and glorify you as a church body. Today, especially on Mother's Day, we want to give you thanks for all the women you've called to be mothers to children here on earth. We remember and praise you for all biological mothers, adoptive mothers, stepmothers, single mothers, grandmothers, and spiritual mothers within the church. We are so grateful for your sacrificial love that is so beautifully displayed in the heart of a mother. We ask for your blessing on expectant mothers and that you will deliver their babies safely. We ask for your guidance for mothers of toddlers, school-aged children, and teenagers as they raise ambassadors to know and love you. We ask for your peace for mothers who have lost a child and those grieving with infertility. May you comfort them and give them hope and rest and knowing that you are the perfect provider. We praise you for grandmothers and the maturity and wisdom they bring. We ask that you keep them within your care here on earth until you call them home. Lord, we thank you for the gift of motherhood, for every moment of joy, pain, struggle, grief, every sleepless night, for the never-ending moms, for the mountains of laundry and dirty dishes, knowing that through all the highs, lows, and mundane everyday moments, all mothers, both young and old, have the beautiful opportunity and privilege to teach others about you and your great love demonstrated on the cross. What an amazing, glorious calling. We love you and praise you, Father, in your precious and most holy name. Amen. In uh, high school, my friend's parents led a ministry to some of the elderly men and women in our home church, and they'd get together for Bible studies and dinners and trips throughout the year. And one year, they planned a trip to the Wisconsin Dells for the church, and my friend invited me to go with them. And as a high schooler, in my honesty, it didn't really sound super fun to travel with the older people in our church. Um, but what I didn't realize is how wild older church members can be. And they spend that entire week yelling and making loud jokes and pulling pranks on each other. It was a lot of fun. One of the attractions we visited is a place called House on the Rock in Spring Green, Wisconsin. And if you're thinking, well, what is that? Um, it's literally a house on a rock. I have a picture of it on the screen. I'm going to read a, a piece of an article that shares some of the history of this. During the 1940s, a man named Alex Jordan discovered a 60-foot chimney rock in the be beautiful Wyoming Valley. It was here that he decided to build a house on the sandstone formation called Deer Shelter Rock. Jordan built the house as a weekend retreat never intended for it to be a tourist attraction. However, people kept coming to see the wonder they had heard about. So Jordan eventually started asking for 50 cent donations. That was only the beginning. 14 room house, the original structure of what is now a complex of many buildings, exhibits, and garden displays. It takes many hours to walk through the house on the rock. Nearly impossible to see all in one day. Among the collections of collections within the world's largest carousel, boasting 269 carousel animals, 182 lanterns, more than 20,000 lights, 
and hundreds of mannequin angels hanging from the ceiling all around it. It is a crazy eclectic experience. Highly recommend you go. My wife doesn't like it, but I, I thought it was interesting. So highly recommend House on the Rock. This morning, I want to study a different kind of house on a rock, specifically how we build our lives on Christ, our rock. How we avoid just becoming some casual, apathetic churchgoers and become intentional about building our life on something that truly matters. That's what I want. I hope that as believers in Christ that, is, that are listening to this message, that's what you want. Thursday morning, I sat in my chair at home with my Bible and prayed that kind of prayer to the Lord. Lord, I want to build my life on Christ and His Word. Lord, I want to build my friendships on Christ. Lord, I want to build my marriage on Christ. Lord, I want to build this family on Christ. You and I need to hear this clearly. That kind of intentional building does not happen by accident. You and I, we can fake Christianity pretty easily, but we will not fake proper building on Christ. You can have a house that looks pretty, but is easily destroyed. We want something greater than that, and I want to show us how we can build our lives on Christ and what that would actually mean for us today. So we're going to start in Luke 6, Luke chapter 6. Um, if you have a digital Bible, I'll read out the ESV. You've got a bulletin handout. Everything's on the back. But before we study together, let's pray. Father, we uh, come before you. And as I, I prayed in the first service, and I pray now that you would, you would have your way. In this moment, in this church, Father, each of us, we come into a building like this and we've, we've got our own baggage and we have our own things we're dealing with and plans for this week. I pray that you would get rid of it all. Every thought outside of your word, remove it. So we interact with the power and the authority of the scripture. It's not what I want, what I want to teach and share to the church. It's, it's what your word would say. So help me, Father, help me to get out of the way, Father, so you can do what you, only you can do. And we pray these things in your Son's name, amen. We're continuing on in our series called More Than a Story. We're looking at parables in the Gospel of Luke. As a reminder, a parable is a story or an illustration that is cast along truth. A parable is a story that brings, gives us greater clarity about the kingdom of God, and that's what we'll find in Luke chapter 6. We have Jesus. He's on a mountainside near Capernaum. He's overlooking the Sea of Galilee. He's surrounded by a crowd, and the crowd is now sitting down, and they're listening to his teaching, what some might have heard called the Sermon on the Mount. And this parable that we're going to read this morning is the conclusion of that sermon on the mountainside. So Jesus, he's looking at the crowd, all sitting down on the mountainside. And this is what he shares with them in Luke chapter 6. I'll start in verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I show you what he is like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. When a flood rose and the stream broke against the house, it could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them, he's like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. And when the stream broke against it, immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. Now, I want to turn over to Matthew and share Matthew's version of this parable because it gives a fuller account and relates to his own context. So, this is Matthew chapter 7. I'll start in verse 21. This is Matthew's account of this gospel. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. 
but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And cast out demons in your name, do mighty works in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them, will he'll be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat the house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, well, he'll be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell. And, it was the, and great was the fall of it. The account in Luke chapter 6, 46, it kicks off with this question that we have to ask ourselves. Why do you call me Lord, Lord and not do what I tell you? And to be clear, that's, that's an interesting wording here in the text because the repetition of Lord, Lord is not there by accident. It's a Hebrew method of communicating intimacy. So it's as if Jesus is saying, saying, look, if you claim to be so close to me, why don't you do what I say? And that's a pretty aggressive question right at the beginning and has a pretty serious ramifications because the account in Matthew 7, 21 says that everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's how serious that question is. Eternity is at stake if we fail to understand and apply this message. This message is a plea to the Bible Belt. You can say all the right things about Jesus in the Bible and fail to enter the kingdom of heaven. You can raise your hand at VBS as a kid because you didn't want to go to hell and still not enter the kingdom of heaven. You can listen to Christian music and come to church and fail to enter the kingdom of heaven. You can love your neighbor and do plenty of good things in this community and fail to enter the kingdom of heaven. You can prophesy. You can literally, you can cast out demons you can do mighty works in the name of Jesus and fail to enter the kingdom of heaven. So do we understand, East River Park, there are people all over East Tennessee that think they're close to God and they would do a lot of good things in the name of Jesus and one day they'll hear the words, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That's what the people all over East Tennessee will one day hear. That is how serious that question is. The question isn't, how do I look like a good Christian? Forget that. I gave up that rat race years ago. The question is, how do I build my life on Christ? That's what really matters. That is what Jesus is showing us in Luke chapter 6 and Matthew 7. How do you build your life on Christ? Let me give you three very clear answers to that question from the Word. The first one is this, Christ becomes your master Christ becomes your master. The word Lord in Luke 6, 46 and Matthew 7, 21 is kurios in the Greek. It's a title to address a person of a higher status or master of property or slaves. And that is what I believe the problem is that we see in the text and in our own lives. Like we're fine to cry out Lord, Lord out of respect for who Jesus is. Many of us, we grew up in church or around church. Like we, wouldn't, we wouldn't dare disrespect the name of Jesus. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. We're fine to recognize Jesus is higher than ourselves. We literally put a giant sign in our own town that says Jesus is Lord. All of it's true. The name of Jesus, he's high and lifted up. He's greater than you, greater than me. He's King of kings, Lord of lords. But as believers in Christ, Jesus also becomes the master over your own life. That he's not just Lord over everything, he's Lord over you. This is what it says in Romans 6, starting in verse 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness, but what fruit were you getting at that time from the things for which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and it ends with eternal life. 
For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So let me be very clear here. Faith in Christ releases you from the slavery of sin that leads to death, but it also enslaves you to Christ, which leads to freedom. All right, so one slavery leads to death. The other slavery leads to eternal life, but it's still slavery. All of us will serve something or someone in this life. So the very first step of building your life on Christ is realizing who Christ is in your life. He's your master. You are his servant. That's what it means to give your life to Christ. And I remember uh, there was this very sweet older lady in our last church, and uh, she, she was sharing with me her story of coming to Christ. We were standing right outside the church kitchen, and she said, I grew up in church my entire life. I knew all about the Bible. I knew about the gospel. I knew Jesus died for me, and I knew he came back to life. I knew Jesus was God. I knew Jesus was Lord. But what I didn't know is that Jesus was Lord over my life, and that was the difference. And I remember how just emotional she was. that She had spent her entire life sitting in church, and then finally realized who Christ really is. And it changed the game for her. She was baptized uh, in our church. She became hungry to know more about the Bible. Jesus wasn't just some king. He was her king and her master. You will not build your life on Christ if you're not willing to submit your life to Christ as your master. This is what it says in Luke 9.23. Jesus is speaking. And he said to all, if anyone, anyone would come after me, then let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So if you want to say yes to this question. So the question, do you want to build your life on Christ? And you hear that question, you're like, yeah, yes, absolutely. Then you must say yes, that Christ is master over your life. There's no other way or shortcut. Every day you wake up and you say, it's not about me, it's about Jesus and what he wants for my life, which is why Jesus brings up that question, why do you call me master, master, or Lord, Lord, but not do what I say? That's foolishness. Like, that's not even logical. That's like telling God, look, I know your way's better, and I know you love me, and you created me, and you know how many hairs I have on my head, and I know you've given me your word, and I can trust in your promises. I know you're a Lord, but I'm going to do what I want instead. Like, this is my life, I'm going to do what I want, and then I'll check back in with you when my life's over. That's how crazy that sounds. And Jesus, he gives the crowd and us a parable to illustrate the outcome of that decision. So there's two guys. Two very different building plans. One guy, he builds the foundation of his house on the rock. It stands the test of time. The other guy, he builds his house without a foundation, or Matthew's gospel says sand. It does not stand the test of time. One guy builds on a foundation. One guy does not. Both have radically different outcomes. How do you build your life on Christ? Here's point two. Christ becomes your foundation. Christ becomes your foundation. It's not some new idea in the word that God becomes our rock. It's been echoing since the Old Testament, littered all throughout the Bible. This is Deuteronomy 32.4. The rock, his work is perfect for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. Psalm 18.2, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Let me give you some New Testament examples as well. 1 Corinthians uh, 3.11, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 10.4, And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. 1 Peter 2.6, for it stands in Scripture, behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So Christ becomes our foundation, the rock, which we build on. Is Christ the foundation of your friendships? Like, are you just building friendships 
based on mutual hobbies, and I get that. Like some of us have had the same friends since we were little kids. We didn't build those friendships on Christ. We built them because we were the same age, like the same sort of things. And those friendships are good. There's a lot of ministry that happens in those relationships. But we also need friendships built on Christ. Friends we're praying for. Friends we talk about Jesus with. Friends that hurt when others hurt. And we should be that kind of Christ-like friend to others. Is Christ the foundation of your marriage? I met with Michelle and Rick several months ago uh, before their private uh, wedding ceremony. They're a couple in our church, been together for quite some time, but made the decision to get married. And uh, Michelle specifically told me during that meeting, we want a Christ-centered marriage. And we've never, we've never had that before, and that's what we want this marriage to be. That is what a healthy marriage foundation looks like. That from the very beginning, a husband and a wife love Christ and want to build their relationship on Christ. Marriages don't fail because a husband and wife love the Lord as master over their life. Marriages fail because someone in the marriage, and oftentimes both uh, individuals, want their own way. Don't get married to someone that isn't interested in building a foundation on Christ. You are asking for a world of hurt. Don't build a marriage on fleeting material things, beauty, vacations, romantic feelings. All of those things come and go. Christ will not. Is Christ the foundation of your marriage? Is Christ the foundation of your family? Moms, dads? Like, what, what do you want your children to become? You want them to be successful? You want them to be good at sports? You want them to have a strong work ethic? And all of those things are, are fine, but if Christ is the foundation of our family, then we want our children to love the Lord more than anything else. Moms, dads? Do you pray with your kids? Do you talk to them about the Bible? Do you show them how much God loves them? Do you share the gospel with them? Do you apologize to your kids? I, I think of the times that I've, I've gone in the boys' room and just said, I looked at Ezra and said, I'm sorry. Um, I mean, I, I, I was frustrated. But I shouldn't have yelled at you like that. I, should, I mean, I knew what, what was going on in my heart when I lost control. I shouldn't have been that angry with you. Forgive me. It's a picture of the gospel to your kids. Moms, dads, if Christ is the foundation of your family, can you prove it? Our kids, they just started sports uh, a few weeks ago, and I love it. I love watching Eliza do cartwheels everywhere and love watching the boys play baseball. But the schedule has been far greater than we realize. And I have to ask myself, is Christ really the foundation of my family if I'm at the ballpark six or seven days a week? And I don't, to be honest, I don't even know the answer to that right now. It's a battle. What I do know for sure is I'm not going to let sports or the school system or anyone else crowd my child's heart so they can't see the love of Christ and be taught his word. Is Christ the foundation of your family? If you say yes, then prove it. I'm talking to myself. Um, not saying I got that figured out. I'm not entirely sure what it looks like for us. It's a battle, but we're trying, we're trying to prove it. Is Christ the foundation of this church? Matthew 16, 18, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell shall, now, shall not prevail against it. Peter or the leaders that came after him are not the rock of the church. Jesus is saying that he's the rock, and Jesus is the rock, the foundation for which this church is built, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's Christ, the foundation of East River Park. I've told you all this a thousand times. A strong church 
will not be a strong church because of excellent programs or music or events. We might look like a strong church when we have those things. And there's certainly nothing wrong with those things, but we will only be a strong church when this church is built on Christ. That's what I want East River Park Christian Church to be about. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about if this church meets your needs and makes you feel good every week. It's not about your preferences or opinions. And that doesn't mean that we don't listen to people and we don't value what they have to say. What it means is that this church isn't built on opinions, but on Christ Jesus. It's why we teach the word every single Sunday. We don't take weeks off of that. Christ and his word is our foundation. He will build his church. How do you build your life on Christ? There's three. Christ becomes your security. Christ becomes your security. So Luke and Matthew, they both record a storm that came against the homes of the two men in the parable. Luke records a storm that came and it caused a flood and the waters rose and the man that built the house on a foundation withstood those flood waters. The other man's house immediately fell when the water broke against it. Matthew, he records a storm that came and caused rain and floods and heavy winds and the winds blew and beat against the house with the foundation, but it didn't fall. The winds blew and beat against the house without a foundation, and the text reads that it was a great fall. Very different outcomes between the two men, but here's something that's not different. They both had to deal with the storm. Even if Christ is your master, even if Christ is your foundation, none of it means you're exempt from the storm. You might love the Lord with all your heart and might be doing all the right things. You might be crying out, Lord, Lord, and you actually are doing what Christ wants. And you might do all of that and still lose your job or get cancer. Watch someone you love suffer or deal with crippling financial issues or battle dark depression or swim through exhausting anxiety or feel this like overwhelming stress that you're just failing at this life. So don't think that followers of Christ are exempt from the storm. We aren't. Life's still hard. Marriage is still hard. Raising kids is still hard. Being a good friend is still hard. Storms are coming whether you love Christ or not. The difference is Believers walk through storms with a firm foundation on Christ, where Christ is our security when it feels like those floodwaters are rising to a dangerous level. Christ is our security when the winds are beating against the house, where we have invested in eternity and our life is built on Christ and He becomes our security. The last few years we were living in Illinois, uh, we stayed in the church parsonage. And this church had been remodeled years ago as like a women's shelter for the church. Never really became that, but it was built that way. So lots of weird nooks and crannies all over the house. Um, There were like beds built into the wall and a few different rooms and one in the hallway. Just a, a pretty unusual house, perfect for our family. But as you would go upstairs, you'd walk through this tiny hallway with a low ceiling, and then went to open up to this huge master bedroom. And this room was, it was just so big that our bedroom set just looked like a little miniature set in there. But it was, it was a perfect room. The only problem is that it, it faced an open cornfield. Nothing blocked the wind or rain from hitting the bedroom. There were trees that had surrounded the, the house, but those had been wiped out by the wind uh, long before we had moved in. And when a storm came at night, we knew it. And there were many storms where Corey and I, we'd lay in bed and think, there's a good chance we'll probably die tonight. And this this wind would, I mean, the wind would literally, it would shake the house and lightning, it would light up the room and the rain beat against the side of the house. It was as loud as the thunder and we never, we literally never slept through a storm in that room. 
I laid there wondering if the house would collapse. So yeah, it's hard to have much peace in a storm. And it, it's hard to have a decent perspective on things when all you see are the trials of life just getting higher, rising higher and higher. It's hard to be very hopeful when it seems like discouragement gets louder and louder. And I want to remind you and myself that when our life is built on Christ, He becomes our security through any storm. For some of us, uh, like we're going through it right now, man, it's been a rough season. For some of us, uh, those storms are just really just right around the corner. But regardless, as believers, Christ will be our security where his death and his resurrection has secured for us an eternal inheritance that will never separate us from the love of God. I'll finish with this. This is Romans 8, starting in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall it be tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written for your sake, we're being killed all the day long. We're regarded, regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. So I'm sure, I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor, height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Christ Jesus our Lord. So yeah, storms will come for sure. But no storm will ever conquer someone who has built their house on the rock. How do you build your life on Christ? Christ becomes your master. And Christ becomes your foundation. And Christ becomes your security. If you have any questions about these parables, you want to make a decision to follow Christ, or just want someone to talk to, I'd love to talk with you and pray with you after the service. But we'll pray and we'll sing.